I, I speak about the importance of the mathematical analysis among, among the four ways of knowledge in the assessment of historical buildings or monuments. Uh, mainly on this aspect, I will not sp speak about the design in, and the interventions. Um, where is the progress? Okay, here. Uh, this is uh, a brief, uh, brief, very short uh, curriculum. So, the, about the present state knowledge, to, to know how is the global structural behavior and, and local behaviors of a um, historical structure, generally we have to follow uh, the well-known four ways of knowledge. That is the historical analysis, the direct observation, the experimental analysis, in situ and in laboratory, and the mathematical analysis. Many uh, engineers are thinking that mathematical analysis are only for the assessment of the safety level. But uh, on the contrary, I think that it is very important to, to be considered as a tools, a, a tool for the knowledge, to improve the knowledge of a historical structure. Um, mathematical analysis are three types uh, around numerical linear analysis that are mainly devoted to, for the structure uh, analysis, uh, analysis behavior, and uh, numerical nonlinear analysis that are both for the, the investigation of the structural behavior and the safety evaluation, and collapse also mechanisms in uh, closed form that are. Uh, um, also, in this case, they are both devoted for the structural investigation and for the safety evaluation. Um, about the mathematical analysis, more in detail, uh, the dynamic analysis, the linear elastic dynamic analysis, are very important to, to understand the possible forms, the possible mode of uh, the formation of the building before the starting of the cracks, because we are in the elastic field. But uh, this uh, analysis is, uh, may highlight uh, the weaker parts of the structure, where the cracks may start, where, may, uh, where there is the pattern, uh, crack pattern starting position. Uh, then also the nonlinear analysis may be used for, uh, um, to, to study the structural behavior of, uh, the, 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 of a monument, but uh, Kushov analysis is also, is also very good for the uh, safety level assessment. Um, now I will start uh, with two case studies. Case studies. Uh, I choose two case studies that uh, I developed in collaboration with the Professor Giorgio Croci, that, uh, uh, which unfortunately is uh, passed away one month ago. So for me, this uh, is also a way for remembering uh, uh, Professor Croci. The, the first case study is the, the investigation for the, uh, to understand the collapse mechanism of the two vaults uh, in the, during the earthquake of 1997 in the um, Basilica of Assisi, of San Francesco in Assisi. Uh, during that earthquake, uh, collapsed the two vaults and two transversal arches. I don't see the mouse. Echo. Uh, one vault and one, the first transversal arch near the facade, and another vault with the transversal arch at the, at the connection between the nave and the transept. This in the upper uh, basilica of Assisi. Uh, why collapsed these two uh, vaults? Because they are near the supporting structure, the facade and the transept, when well, we have the transversal action of a seismic action. So we have a, a concentration stress just in these two points. Another observation uh, is that collapsed only two arches, the transversal arches, while the diagonal arches not collapsed. But uh, here we have two photos. This uh, the, the, on the right, uh, on the right, uh, the, the, the collapse near the, um, the facade, and here the collapse near the transept. We can see that uh, the transversal arch are Gothic arch, while 
the diagonal arches are nearly circular arches. So the, we know that the, the Gothic arches are very weaker to uh, respect to horizontal actions uh, in front of the circular arches. Uh, but, uh, however, not only the collapsed uh, vaults suffered, but also the survived vaults have a, a lot of damages. We can see here an inversion of curvature, uh, cracks here on these arches, these transversal arches, crash in compression on, on near the one moment near the key of the of the arch, uh, while we have crack intensive stress on the extrados of the key of the vault. Uh, this is not normal. Normally, we uh, in the in an arch we we expect that the, the tensile stress are in the intradox of the key, but uh, this is a sign that the, there is something not functioning very well. Uh, and the reason of this malfunctioning, but functioning, is the, uh, this rubber filling that we can see here. This rubber filling was not uh, present in the origin, uh, original state. Uh, we can see that the arches that support the roof have the foundation of the uh, solid filling of the vaults. This uh, uh, rubber filling are, was accumulated along the century, and we escaped it with uh, some archaeologists. And we have found that the, the, the archaeologists uh, have found that there was an increment of 50 centimeters every 50 years. That is around the return period of the maintenance of the roof. So we can see that there are tiles in this rubble filling. So there was a, a bad uh, practice in the maintenance of the uh, building, okay? Then we made a, 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 a mathematical model to see if this filling was the main cause of these collapses. And already with the dead load, we can see that the action of the filling causes a tensile stress at the extrados of the key of the vault and of the arch. Then we have made also a static equivalent analysis with the transversal action, and we can see how this filling causes the inversion of the curvature of the transversal arch exactly in this position near the upper level of the filling. Then we have uh, carried out uh, um, a, a model, a dynamic model analysis, linear and dynamic model analysis, and we control uh, the different mode of vibration. And we have seen that the principal mode of vibration have uh, always uh, the main tensile stress in the transversal arch near the upper level, upper level of the filling. This is a, you can see the difference in the stress between the transversal arch and the diagonal arch. The diagonal arch has a very lower stress. Okay, this is mode four. Then uh, this is mode five. And uh, another time we can see that the main maximum intensity stress is in the transversal arch in this point. Then uh, this is the mode seven. And another time, the maximum tensile stress in this, is in this position. Here we have mode nine. Another time, we have the maximum tensile stress in this position while the diagonal arch are not very stressed. So we, from this analysis, we have the, uh, the assessment, the perfect assessment that the, this rubber filling was the main cause of this collapse uh, in the Basilica of Assisi. This uh, um, mathematical model was validated. Uh, this model was made immediately after the earthquake, but this model was validated observing the film made by Umbria Television during the collapse. Uh, 
um, there was a cameraman in the basilica in the morning of uh, 26 uh, of September 1997 because there was already another shock, seismic shock in the night before. So there was a survey to control the damages to the frescoes of Giotto and Cimabue. During this survey, there was another shock in, at 11 in the morning, and there was the collapse. So Umbria TV, Umbria Television, was able to make this uh, uh, film, and we can see here, the, the first arch near the facade that is starting to make an inversion of the curvature under the pressure, the, the thrust of the vault. Here, there is already the snapping. The, the arch is under compression. So when the, there is the inversion of the curvature, there is an acceleration. So the, the arch detach from the vault, also if it was the vault that uh, uh, trusted the arch, but the arch make an acceleration and escape away very fast. So you can see this another photogram. And so the uh, arch escape and then also the vault go after the arch and go uh, start the collapse of the vault. When is uh, completed the, 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 the collapse of the, of the left part in this photo, uh, start also the collapse of the right part that have lost the support. And then we have the collapse. Uh, so this uh, is uh, a validation about the, the formation of the numerical model, but the numerical model have uh, uh, very well shown as uh, the main cause of this collapse was uh, the rubble filling accumulated uh, along the century from the 15th century when there was uh, rebuilt the roof with that uh, big arches that were supporting the roof from uh, 15th century up to now there was a continuous increment of this filling that uh, in the end caused this collapse. Uh, during the earthquake of 1997. Another uh, case study is uh, the uh, Basilica of uh, Hagia Sophia, uh, where happened also other um, two important collapse of uh, the main dome in the 10th and the 14th century uh, be because of strong earthquakes. Uh, but uh, we have, uh, before to analyze the, the building of the, the building phases of this uh, structure, and we have to take into account that all the main domes uh, of the past are based on the parameter, of, on the referiment, referiment reference of Pantheon. Pantheon is a very good structure with a very good uh, structural behavior. So in the past, uh, every time uh, when they wanted to build very big uh, domes, they, they, need, uh, they wanted to take as a reference the Pantheon. So the diameter of 43 meters of the Pantheon is the reference for the uh, Agia Sofia, for uh, uh, Santa Maria del Fiore, in Florence built by Brunelleschi and also for St. Peter in Rome built by Michelangelo. Every time there is this diameter as uh, uh, of about 43 meters. Uh, but the builder of Hagia Sophia decided to enlarge the space, not a circular space like this, but they decided to cut the sphera inscribed in, uh, in the Pantheon. In the Pantheon, we can inscribe a sphera touching, touching the, 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 the pavement. So that this cornice exactly at half of the height from the pavement up to the oculus. And they decided the, to cut this sphera in such a way to obtain a very soldier vault with these uh, uh, squinches, and this element have the radius of the sphere of the Pantheon. 
Then cutting in this way the sphere, uh, they placed a windowed wall under this main arch and attached hemidomes on these arches in the longitudinal direction. In this way, with also these other little hemidomes, they obtained a very big rectangular space. But this first dome was very social, so very lowered. So uh, it was very weak in case of little movement of the supporting structure. So if we compare the uh, section of the Pantheon with the diagonal section of the Hagia Sophia, which uh, along the diagonal, there is the diameter of 43 meters, uh, we can see that this uh, very thin vault may very easily invert the curvature if there is a movement of the pillar, which is very, uh, a very stiff element. So a, a little movement of this pillar can cause the losing of the curvature of, the, of this vault. And in fact, the, this first vault of Hagia Sophia collapsed 21 years after the first building under Justiniano. So the, the Hagia Sophia, the first dome was finished in 537 and in 558, it completely collapsed after minor earthquakes, okay? Then the um, architect, uh, the, the first architects were um, Isidoro from Mileto and Antemio from Tralle. Then, 20 years after, uh, Isidoro from Mileto the Younger uh, decided, understood the problem of the very uh, social dome and decided to make a new dome with the middle reduced radius, with the same base but reduced radius to have a higher curvature in such a way to, uh, to make a dome more able to absorb differential movement of the supporting structure. So this second uh, dome built after the collapse of uh, 558 is uh, the present dome of uh, Hagia Sophia, but uh, however suffered other two important collapse in occasion of two strong earthquakes. A first big earthquake happened in the 10th century, exactly 989, and collapsed the transversal arch, the west transversal arch, and this portion of the main, of the central vault. Uh, the, the, the main axis is east-west. The transversal direction is north-south. Okay, so this part collapsed and was rebuilt in the 10th century. Then in the 14th century collapsed the east arch, transversal arch, with this portion of the, of the dome. So this, the original 6th century dome are only this part, okay? Attached to the south and to the north, longitudinal arches that with the uh, that are over the window at the walls then the problem was among the researcher that was studying the behavior of uh, Hagia Sophia one of the problem was to understand which component of a seismic action may cause more easily a collapse like these two uh, the transversal component of the seismic action on the longitudinal component of the seismic action. So we made uh, a refined uh, finite element model with many elements in the thickness to understand uh, when uh, that uh, was used for a non-linear analysis, uh, a static equivalent non-linear analysis. Uh, and so we can see uh, using many elements in the thickness if uh, a crack is passing throughout the thickness or not. So uh, with this model, we built up two half models. One to study the transversal 
action. This is the transversal arch. These are a longitudinal arch with the window and the wall. Uh, so this half model to study the effect of the transversal acceleration and this other model to study the effect with the longitudinal acceleration. So we made this nonlinear analysis and we went to compare the crack patterns of this nonlinear analysis. The crack pattern, this is the longitudinal, um, the model for the longitudinal action. We can see that this crack pattern is not very in agreement with the uh, sign of the collapse of the 10th and the 14th century uh, collapses. And we, if we super, overimpose this, uh, the cracks that we can see in the model, this line, uh, red line, are the cracks passing throughout the thickness of the model, and the area more damaged that may, may be considered symmetrical because uh, the nonlinear, the static equivalent nonlinear analysis is a monotonic action. That and then we, if, uh, if we invert the direction, we have the crack on this other side. But uh, we can see that the, the the damaged area is that survived not the collapsed area of the 10th century and 14th century. So we can we, we went to, to analyze, but uh, one moment before I want to see that, however, the uh, want to say that, however, this longitudinal component of the seismic action make damages on the survived arch that have the sign of these damages. This is the longitudinal arch with the window at the wall and you can see here this uh, inversion of curvature, but uh, also if damaged, this arch survived. This is the model of this uh, uh, longitudinal arch with the formation under this uh, uh, longitudinal action. Then we made the, the second model for studying the transversal acceleration, and we can see that the crack pattern, crack pattern that arise in this case, is more in agreement with the collapsed areas. You, we can see in, with the increment of the action, we can see the, the situation on the transversal arch, okay, and the crack pattern. Then we can see the red line are always the cracks in the model that are passing throughout the thickness. We can see that, uh, and we, we have to, to, to take into account that this is a symmetrical if we invert the action, we can see that now the crack pattern and the more cracked area are inside the 10th century collapsed area and also inside the 14th century collapsed area. And moreover, one of the passing crack throughout the model are exactly on the limit of the collapsed part of the 14th century. So from this, uh, uh, from these models, uh, we have uh, the answer that uh, the transversal component uh, is the um, main, uh, is the action that may more easily may cause a collapse like that uh, of 10th century and 14th century, while the longitudinal component, however, make damages to the structure, but not, is, is not the main responsible about uh, the, these collapses. Uh, moreover, we have, uh, observing the, the mathematical model, we may have an explanation of uh, other aspects that, that we can uh, notice uh, making a survey on, uh, on, the, on, the, on the monument. For example, we can see that uh, if we take away from the model, the, the, from the, the view of the model, the dome, and we observe the base of the, of the dome just over the arches, with the transversal direction uh, action, we have to take into account that uh, the mass of the squinches are very eccentric respect to the axis vertical axis of the pillar, of the main pillar. And this uh, eccentricity is on the same side, and this causes a um, 
a torsional movement of the pillars that go in the same direction for both the pillars. One times clockwise with the action in one direction and counterclockwise with the action in the other direction. But however, the, this uh, torsional movement causes a sinusoidal, sinusoidal deformation of the base of the dome. Okay, so we went another time to the uh, direct observation of the monument, and we can see that there is this point at the connection between the rebuilt part after the collapse of 14th century and the survived part of uh, over the longitudinal arch. So in the squinch, in the squinches, in, uh, in this position, we have the sign of this strong deformation, sinusoidal deformation that we can see here. So this, uh, uh, this sign may be explained with this uh, torsional movement of the, of the pillars that cause this deformation at the base of the dome. This uh, another photo of, this, of the same part. We can see that uh, when they rebuilt, they were not able to recover this deformation on, on the survived part. Another aspect that we can um, I can show you uh, is uh, may, taken from a, another model of the Hagia Sophia. This is the global model. We have made this global model to be able to make the dynamic model analysis uh, and to have also the, so the, the possibility to, to study also the torsional global movement, uh, uh, torsional mode of vibration and so on. But uh, now I show you only the dead load effect. If we consider the dead load effect, that is the permanent load, we, consider, we can see that there is a thrust of the hemidome against the central dome. And this is uh, better um, uh, visible from this top view with uh, the elastic deformation amplified. This is the, the, the effect of the dead loads and we can see the thrust of the, of the hemidome, also the other hemidome, and the ovalization of the, um, of the main dome with a reduction of the longitudinal diameter and the, an expansion, expansion of the transversal diameter. And also a deformation of the longitudinal arches that have uh, that has uh, an elastic deformation in this uh, direction. Uh, these are elastic deformation because this is an elastic model, but uh, the actions are permanent. So we was thinking that uh, these permanent actions along the century may cause uh, viscous deformations. Okay. So we went back another time to the uh, direct observation and uh, from the bottom, uh, we can see that uh, the dome has uh, a little ovalization. So there is a reduction of the longitudinal diameter, main diameter and uh, an expansion of the transversal diameter. Also, if uh, it's difficult to be seen uh, in this photo but there are some centimeters of difference between these two diameters. And these are effects that may uh, explain it only with viscous effect. But we wanted also to control this deformation of the longitudinal arch. Okay, here we have the arch with under the arch, the window at the wall. So we went back to the direct observation, but this, uh, is not very easy to be seen. These are the windows, the, the wall with the windows. This is the longitudinal arch, very thick, because they were aware that uh, there was the thrust of the dome. So uh, the arch is very large in, in thickness, horizontal thickness. And uh, we can see after also this flying arch here. And also there is another on this other side to reduce 
the free span of this part in respect to the trust of the vault. But from this position, it's very difficult to see a deformation. So we went up to the monument here to make a photo of this cornice from this position. And we can see that the deformation is there. We can see the cornice here, very deformed. There are many centimeters of the horizontal deformation of the, this is the longitudinal arch. And we can see also here a strong deformation, transversal strong deformation. And these are viscous deformations suggested by um, this observation was suggested by our uh, numerical models, but these are viscous deformation due to the permanent thrust along the century, the permanent thrust of the main dome. So this is the, I, I, uh, I have nearly finished, I finished my presentation. Here we have some uh, reference for the, for the study of the Hagia Sophia. Uh, very important was the work of Mainstone and also the uh, graphic survey of Van Nuys. We use the graphic survey of Van Nuys to make our uh, mathematical models. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Professor Viskovic. This was fantastic. Um, of course, just a touch of what has been done because subsequently there were interventions after these studies, but we just wanted to to give the, this. Um, the, the study for the Hagia Sophia was just a study for the Ministry of Conservation of Turkey to, to give them uh, some information mm -hmm. like that I show you. Uh, in the case of, uh, of Assisi, the, the, that was the first uh, stage uh, to, to design the intervention for re reinforcement, uh, retrofitting, uh, and rebuilding of the uh, collapsed wall. Yeah, and probably we need to organize one session just to see the whole intervention because it's, it's, mm -hmm. it's very remarkable. Um, I put in the chat uh, a note saying, please uh, put questions there. We will have this question and answer session after the second speaker. Um, so we move now to Matthew Petticrew, um, also a structural engineer. Uh, he's um, a technical um, director at WSP. Um, had a number of student prize, uh, just started early with his Sussex um, and work in a variety of, of companies in new build and also in conservation. Um, as you will have seen in his CV, he's currently dealing with the HS2 a project appraising um, existing buildings and monitoring. So I'll leave you with Matthew. Okay. Well, hopefully everyone can see the screen that I'm sharing uh, at the moment. Um, I'd like to begin by Thanking Christina for the opportunity to give a talk. Um, it was a real honour to be asked, and I was uh, delighted to accept. That, that was that was really good. Um, as Christina said, uh, I'm a technical director at WSP, and I'm also a, a heritage building enthusiast. I, I do enjoy um, talking and learning about old buildings. It, it was certainly great to to um, hear what Alberto had to say. Um, I think the only Possibly the only downside is that I've now got to follow him, so uh, I'll, I'll, I'll do my best um, not, not to disappoint. The, the title that I've given to my talk is The Conservation of Structural Adequacy um, and How We Know That Structures Are Safe. It's, it's a really important topic because without knowing how a historical building stands up, it's very difficult to be um, sensitive in the way that we do conservation or, or repair work. Um, so what I plan to do with the talk is, is talk very briefly about what I mean by structural adequacy. And then I have gone ahead and divided history up into some convenient slices. And 
I've picked some archetype structures to represent each of those periods in time. And I've given them the name Euclidean, Equilibrium, Enlightenment, Empirical and Excel structures. And once I've run through those, I'll maybe draw some conclusions. And then finally, if there's time, perhaps offer some thoughts about some principles of um, conservation, if that's okay. Um, but before we do that, I, I have a, a, a little bit of a health warning um, to give. And that is that the, the archetypes that I have chosen are completely arbitrary. They, I, I'm not for a moment suggesting they're either the first or the best example um, of the type that we're going to talk about. And I, I'm also perfectly aware that I, I've sort of divided up history into some fairly arbitrary blocks. And I, I, I realize that history doesn't, doesn't quite work like that in a, in a linear timeline. Um, I'm obviously only have a short period of time. So you, you'll have to forgive me for painting with quite a, a broad brush. Um, the, the other thing that I was going to say as well is I, I, I'm also aware that, that I'm, I'm talking about structures that are probably monumental in scale because those are the ones that have, have come down to us and, and our profession are custodians of those particular structures today. I, it's obviously much harder to talk about um, smaller things at a, at a more domestic scale. So, what do I mean by structural adequacy? Well, the way that I'm defining that is to divide it into two parts. Um, it can, it's obviously a, a, a more tricky concept than that, but I, I'm going to keep it simple. Um, the first part is the identification of a load path. And what I mean by that is the route by which load is conveyed from the top of the structure to the bottom, hopefully where it, it finds its way into the ground via the foundation. And the second part is the verification of that load path. And that is, in other words, how we check that each of the component parts within the load path are strong and stiff enough to convey the loads to which they are subject. Um, now, I think it's, it's probably reasonably self-evident that, that sophisticated load paths developed before um, the verification um, process became quite sophisticated. And we will sort of shortly see uh, how that came about, uh, I hope. The, um, the first structure that I've selected to talk about is the pyramid at Maidam, and it represents the Euclidean um, type of structure. Now, the reason I've chosen um, a pyramid is because it's necessarily reliant on um, Euclidean geometry. Indeed, if you were to go to the British Museum, you would see or, or could see the, the, the rind papyrus, which um, specifically talks about um, the geometry uh, of pyramids. Now, I, I'm also perfectly aware that, 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 that Euclid um, lived a long time after the pyramids, um, but I'm, I'm prepared to make the stretch and let him cover the ancient world because he was broadly contemporary with the, the library at Alexandria, where he lived um, in Egypt. And I'm quite sure some of the old Egyptian records would have been there. And uh, I don't think I'm pushing the boundaries too much by saying that when he, he wrote his, his great tome on, uh, on geometry, the elements, he, he's likely to have drawn on some of those Egyptian sources. Um, but of course, it would be tempting to think of pyramids as just being a big pile of stones and not being terribly sophisticated. Um, but I, I, I would like to maybe sort of show why that isn't the case. Um, this, this is a cross section. I think it was originally drawn by Jean Carissal um, from the, the Ecole in Paris. And um, it shows some of the work that was done at Maidam. And I'm, I'm hoping you'll be able to see my cursor, but you can see how it's divided up into a nucleus and a series of concentric rings or, or squares that go around the outside. And there's a very good reason for that. Um, it's fairly self-evident that the, the weight at the bottom of a pyramid isn't even. Most of the weight is obviously directly under the point in the middle. 
and the weight sort of reduces as it comes to the outside. And it therefore stands to reason that you're going to get an awful lot more settlement under the middle of the, the pyramid compared to the outside of the pyramid. So by dividing the pyramid up into these um, slices and at the junctions, um, the stones on the outside of the, 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 the inner section of wall was, was prepared very carefully and had a good smooth surface. Although the inside um, of the outer piece uh, less so, but that allowed the walls to slip relative to each other, thus allowing greater settlement on the inside than on the outside without the blocks um, starting to crack and cause a problem. So that I mean that that's really quite a sophisticated understanding um, for the period in time in which the, the, the pyramids were constructed. It's, it's, it's also worth noting that because they, there's these really well prepared blocks on the outside and, and less so on the inside, the inside is of, of, of each uh, square is more prone to consolidate and push outwards than the smooth surfaces on the outside. And Imhotep, the, the, the designer, I think, probably had a, a, a feeling for that and he was able to optimize the angle at which the stones were set down, um, such that it balanced the tendency for the, the, the outward thrust. And the angles that, 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 that he selected were, were all based on prime numbers. I think it was two and seven and 11, that that was the case. Um, but the, the, that, that sort of covers the, the, the load path part. The, the, the verification is, is kind of interesting as well. I'd, I've showed pictures of, of four um, pyramids here, and uh, I, I'm not an Egyptologist, but I, I do understand Saqqara was the first, and then working down towards Dashur North, where we have the first true pyramid, you can see the sort of intermediate stages that were um, established to get to the, the, the form that, that people perhaps recognize. And, and so it seems that there was certainly a period of trial and error to get those angles and, and steps in the face of the pyramid correct. So the, 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 I guess the lesson that I want to, 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 to pass on from the ancient world is that um, when we talk about trial and error, we, we're not just talking about um, you know the run random guesses by chance. We're actually talking about um, designers who understood load paths and, and made controlled experimentation based on that rational load path um, to create these, these, these magnificent structures that, that, that we still have with us today. The next um, structure that I have chosen to look at is the Basilica of San Petronio in Bologna. And it's going to do the job of looking after equilibrium structures for me. Um, now, that might seem like a little bit of an odd choice because many of the great cathedrals of the late medieval period are in many ways far more impressive with their um, flying buttresses and quadripartite vaults and, and so forth. And probably, um, get a lot more attention than, than San Petronio. Um, so we're going to come back to San Petronio and take a little bit of a, a, a diversion before, before we get back there. Um, the question that I would really like to start by asking is that each cathedral um, that we have that, that's well known and has, has these, these incredible delicate features um, is slightly different. How is it that the medieval masons were able to demonstrate that these structures could stand safely using only rules of thumb? Um, now, the reason that's an important question is that modern analysis that's been done on um, these cathedrals show that the proportions are, are almost perfect or, or as, as, as near as we can get to perfect. How, how do we do that with such crude um, thing as, as a rule of thumb. I think the, to understand the answer to that, we, 
we maybe have to start going back to think about road paths again. And I think one of the things that, that, that's definitely apparent is that the medieval masons understood road paths. They knew that to be in equilibrium, the, the, the loads that acted down had to be balanced by loads that acted up, and the loads that acted to the left had to be balanced by loads that acted to the right. But more than that, they also understood that the structures had to be in compression throughout. And that, that was a really difficult thing to achieve. And my, my um, postulation, if you like, is that they must have been playing around with scale models to try and understand how to achieve that perfect balance that they actually have. Now, if that's true, that, that, that's a really, interesting thing because as any architectural student will know when they they, they try to make a, a model um, of, of their designs um, scale models don't work um, and the reason they don't work is because of something called the square cube law which was attributed to Galileo um, and I'll, I'll try and explain how that law works in a simple way if you see this cube on the left-hand side here, and it's got sides of one unit length, if, if I was to scale it up by doubling it, and those sides are now two units long, you can see that the face of the cube has increased to four, and the volume of the cube has increased to eight. So just by doubling the size of the cube, I've increased the volume by eight, and therefore it must be eight times as heavy. So there isn't a linear relationship between weight and size. And that's the main reason that scale models are, um, can't normally be used to design structures. So how, how, did, how did they achieve it um, with, with these uh, medieval cathedrals? Well, the key is the fact that the stresses in the stone are very, very low compared to the strength of the stone. And that means that when it's scaled from small to big. If you can make it um, work in small scale, it will also work in large scale. And, and what that means is that it's very much the equilibrium or the balance of the structure that is governing and not the strength. Now, I, I have no idea whether the medieval masons appreciated that they were um, obviating the square cube law, but nevertheless, that, that seems to be what they have done. Now, the reason why I started with the Basilica of San Petrodio is simply this. Um, its designer, um, Vincenzo, he is known to have created a one-eighth scale model of the Basilica. And I'm quite sure it was used to show the patrons um, what the final design was going to look like. But I've also got a little bit of a hunch, and I don't think it's, it's stretching things too far to say that it was probably also used to make sure that the proportions of the structure was correct. And I think it would be interesting for all of those other structures that we have that are perhaps more elegant, but maybe we have an incomplete record. Um, but maybe they also had uh, a similar scale model made that would have helped the Masons understand how the structure is going to behave. The next structure that I wanted to talk about um, is the dome of St. Peter's Basilica. And I'm using that to represent the Enlightenment. Um, so I'm, I'm not, in this case, interested in the original dome's design, which um, had, had a lot of involvement from, from Michelangelo. Um, Instead, what I want to talk about is the work that was done in the 18th century to address cracking in the dome, which had caused its, its structural adequacy to be called into question. Um, now, the, the Pope at the time, who I think was Benedict XIV, he commissioned um, three mathematicians, Thomas Sewer, Francois Jacquet, and Rogero Bosevich, to investigate um, the cracks using mathematical tools. And when they published their findings in 1743, 
that, that was in fact a, a seminal moment for structural engineering because I believe it's the first time we know, know of where mathematics was used to try and solve a structural problem. Um, now, the interesting thing was that these three gentlemen concluded that the, the, the dome of the structure um, was going to collapse. And, and, and that, that, that's kind of problematic because self-evidently it hadn't collapsed. It was very much still standing. Um, and therefore, in those circumstances, the, the committee that looked after um, the Basilica did what many committees do, and they, they simply ignored the report and continued to monitor the structure. Um, Benedict um, wasn't prepared to let it go, though, and he, he was still looking for a, a scientific or mathematical solution. So he, um, he commissioned Polleni to reinvestigate the structure to see what, what could be done. And Polleni um, concluded at the end of his investigation that the structure was in fact stable, but he also recommended some remedial work and that was in the form of iron hoops, which you can sort of see here in this diagram, to be added into the structure. Um, and those were added in, uh, I think it was 1744, um, although a, a further hoop was added in about 1747 because one of the originals um, had fractured. Um, now it's interesting because the, the application of mathematics, although it was a seminal moment, it, it didn't work terribly well first time around and probably for a period after that. And that's because despite the fact that these were incredibly clever people with, with some really smart mathematics, that mathematics in the 18th century wasn't really any match for a thousand years of, of engineering practice that had um, perfected some of these structural forms that were in existence at that time. Um, and so it was going to be a period of time before maths really became the solution that we have today. And at this particular point, it, it left the profession with a, a bit of a dichotomy. Certainly in France and Germany, they, they started to progress down the route of um, academic institutions to, to, to study science and maths of um, uh, of engineering, whereas in, in the UK, we, we tended to, to pursue a more experimental uh, or, or empirical approach for a, a, a longer period of time. And that's the reason why I have chosen my next uh, group of structures to be called empirical structures. And Britannia Bridge um, is a particularly good example of the empirical approach. Uh, it was designed by Robert Stevenson with the help of some others who, who will come on to. But you, you can see a, a, a photograph of the structure in the background there. It, it, it's quite an unusual structure in that it's, it's designed of um, steel tubes, tubes, not iron tubes. And one of the other things that I will draw to your attention is the fact that the, the piers um, certainly in the middle of the span, extend much above the, the level of the bridge. And we'll come back to later exactly why that was. So um, the bridge was to carry a new railway that was to um, take trains out, out towards um, the, the seaports where you could get to Ireland easier. And there'd recently been a suspension bridge that was built um, quite close by, by Thomas Telford, but the suspension bridge was, was deemed to be too flexible for um, trains and the Navy uh, objected to arches being placed into the channel because they felt it would impede navigation. And um, to try and solve the problem, Robert Stevenson had come up with this idea of uh, a box girder. But the trouble was, in 1845, when he was trying to solve the problem, nobody knew how to design how to design an iron box girder. So what he did was he commissioned um, uh, Eden Hodgkinson and uh, William Fairbairn, who were known for their expertise with ironwork, 
and he engaged them in some empirical tests on box girders to see if they could work out how those box girders would um, would work. And that th those were really landmark tests um, because one of the first things they discovered was plate buckling. And that was really important because until that point, everyone had thought that raw iron was weaker in compression than it was in tension. And that certainly wasn't the case. It, it was due to the phenomenon of buckling, which wasn't understood at that time. They also discovered that rivets um, behave by friction rather than doweling action, as everybody had thought up until that point in time. They also experimented with um, continuity of supports and to make the bridges far more uh, efficient rather than being simply supported spans. They looked at the thermal movement, wind effects, all kinds of things. And of course, when they came to build the bridge, uh, many or most of the components would have been proof tested to make sure that they could carry the loads um, that they were required to carry. So it was an incredible piece of work, um, but at the same time, it wasn't all plain sailing. There was a big argument that the three engineers had about whether suspension chains were required to supplement the strength of the, um, the bridge and, and to help it carry the load. Um, Hodgkinson, who was developing some mathematical formulas, believed that chains were required, while Fairbairn, who had been more in charge of the testing, believed that they weren't. And this argument went on for so long that they actually had to build the bridge piers up to the point um, where they could hang chains if they wanted to. And, and that's what I was pointing out in the, the, the first photograph that I showed you. In the end, um, Fairbairn's argument prevailed and Robert Stevenson didn't put in the suspension chains. He ignored the mathematics and the bridge um, was proved to be successful. And uh, that, that, that way of, that method of design re relying on the empirical results proved to be um, satisfactory. And, and, and that was a good example of how that, that approach was to be used. That said, it, it, it wasn't long um, before mathematics started to, to, to gain a bit of traction and become um, a, a better tool. And by about 1856, William Rankin, who, who took up the chair in, in, in engineering, civil engineering at the University of Glasgow, gave his inaugural address on the topic of uh, an introduction, uh, an introductory lecture on the harmony and theory and uh, of practice in mechanics. And you could certainly start to see from, from that point on where things were headed. So the final structure or, or type archetype that I wanted to talk about, I've given the name Excel structures. And what I'm really referring to there is Microsoft Excel. Um, uh, other software obviously is available. And, and that, th this, this represents the modern era and the way in which we tend to rely on computer software to help us solve complex problems. Um, I hope you'll forgive me for selecting one of my own structures from earlier in my career um, to maybe illustrate this archetype. It's at um, Crown Place in London. I'm not going to dwell on it because this, this talk is fundamentally about old structures. It, it's just suffice to say that the, the load paths aren't terribly complicated for this building, but what, what made it interesting and why it needed computer analysis is that for reasons I won't go into, um, one side of the building had to be hung from a two-story truss at roof level rather than being supported from the ground. And the way that we did that was to, to build it off some temporary supports and then jack, you can see the jacks in here, jack the entire side of the building up before attaching it onto this big truss and then taking away the, the supports from below so that it was hanging and trying to work out where all the floors ended up in the final scheme of things was, was a big part of why, why we used the power of a computer to help us. So um, having said all of that, what conclusions can we reach from, from that really quick uh, jump through history? 
The first thing that I wanted to draw your attention to is that Excel structures, as I've called them, don't generally have more complicated load paths than their predecessors. The pyramids have quite a sophisticated load path, despite the fact they predate soil mechanics by more than a thousand years. And the Gothic structures of the late medieval are, are more complex in their load paths than most modern buildings that get dealt with um, by engineers today. Not, not always, but, but generally speaking. Um, the other conclusion that I would reach is that material science and codes of practice don't necessarily result in more efficient or safe designs than, than we had in the past. And, and obviously I, I have to caveat that by saying at least for the structures that have survived and, and, and have come down to us. Um, and my observation would be that even a computer struggles to trump the efficiency of, of a, a structure it's got a form which we've spent a thousand years perfecting. The computer isn't going to give you more than that or a more efficient answer. And I, I suppose I've, I've, I've posed the question, could a computer have improved on Britannia's empirical analysis? But possibly, but my, my hunch is not by much. It, it was a pretty sophisticated analysis that was done at the time. So, there's maybe three primary reasons why modern analysis is valuable. Uh, not, not the only three, but certainly three that are important. It can assess new and untried structural forms and it provides a shortcut. It means you don't have to spend a thousand years um, perfecting that structural form. You can jump straight to the answer. The second thing that it's useful for is that it can assess complex behaviors that are often absent from historic structures, except perhaps the, the empirical type. And I, I'm essentially talking about buckling modes of failure in second order and nonlinear forms of behavior. And of course, coming back to the empirical type of structure, the, the other thing that, that, that is much better about modern analysis is that it's, it's clearly much cheaper and quicker than empirical testing. And you, you could have got an answer to Britannia in a, in a more, more speedy and, and cheap fashion than you could by doing lots and lots of different um, real world experiments. So what then does all of that mean about um, conserving structural adequacy? I think the we have to start by our predecessors to devise some really quite sophisticated load paths without the benefit of computers uh, and, and modern analysis. So what makes us think that we're so smart and, and, and that they weren't? We need to be humble. By doing that, we've got to start trying to get inside the head of the, the person that, that originally designed the structure that we're looking at. And if it's still standing, what were the intended load paths? We can then start to, to ask ourselves other questions like, have the intended load paths been diminished by some sort of historical alteration or some intervention along the way? Or is there some sort of acute distress which is impinging on the load path that was intended? We then might think about, will the load paths be compromised in the future by perhaps some sort of chronic distress that hasn't yet reached the point of being acute, or perhaps because there's some lack of robustness um, that, that, that could make the structure vulnerable in a way that it hasn't yet been tested. Or perhaps just the world has changed and there's some new external factors. Maybe, maybe the climate has made the wind blow stronger than it had before. Maybe the water table is either higher or lower than it was before or maybe there's pollution or additional traffic or something like that that wasn't present when the structure was originally conceived. We're then in a place to start asking ourselves the question, are the current load paths materially better or worse than those with which it started? And if it is worse, why is it worse? And is the residual load path sufficient to do the job that it's been doing presumably for a long time? It's a heritage structure. 
And it's only really once we've started to tackle those questions that we can start to look at the options um, that, that, that are presented to us for, for remediating or, or, or dealing with or altering historic structures. And I, I like to think of what I call a conservation hierarchy. And the first thing we should ask ourselves within that hierarchy is, can we in fact do nothing? Just let the structure be and continue to monitor it. Um, and if that monitoring shows something, changes at a later date, we can deal with it at that point. The second thing on the hierarchy is those external factors that we talked about that maybe weren't there at the time the structure um, was designed or built. Can we do something to deal with those external factors rather than the structure itself? And if we can, maybe we've averted something from happening in the future and then the structure can continue to behave as it does today and as it has in the past. And then perhaps the next step on the hierarchy is, have we identified weaknesses in the load paths, maybe a particular joint or a particular member that needs enhanced? And I want to be clear what I mean by that. I'm not talking about taking that structure and trying to upgrade it to comply with a modern standard or a modern code for which that structure um, wasn't designed in the first place. What I'm talking about is just restoring that load path uh, very locally so that it can continue to do what it has always done. And it's only really once you've, you, you've been through those first three steps in the hierarchy that really you should consider whether or not um, strengthening in the true sense of the word or, or propping in some form should be used as an intervention. And I, I suppose if I wanted to encapsulate that in a sort of in a pithy kind of way, I, I would say that what we're trying to do is avoid turning a Euclidean structure into an Excel structure by trying to impose modern standards or modern ways of looking at the world on an old structure, particularly if that's going to um, detract from it in, in the future. Um, and, and, and I guess that, that's really what's at the heart of conservation engineering. Um, so I just wanted to perhaps finish with um, one further slide. And, and, and that's, that's to say, I, I've obviously skipped through a, a, a bunch of different examples in, in quite a short period of time. And it, it's really just, if, if you wanted to, to learn a little bit more about any of those structures, I, I do sort of keep a, a, a regular blog, um, which the, the, um, the, the address for which is on the screen at the moment. And each of those structures has got maybe a slightly longer little article that's going to be published over the, 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 the coming weeks. So if you wanted to read a little bit more, you could obviously go and read lots of other textbooks as well, and you'd be, you'd be welcome to do that. But maybe there's a, a, a first port of call for you to, to drop in and um, read a little bit more about some of the structures that I've, uh, I've spoken about today. And I think, I think I'll stop there. Thanks very much, Matthew. That was brilliant. So we have, I think, a question in the, um, in the chat, uh, and I will encourage other people also to put questions there or feel free, you know, we keep that in a meeting mode. Um, so you can talk actually. So I will actually encourage um, the person who put the question about the building regulations. Uh, why you want to talk, otherwise I will read it up. Ah, maybe I will read it up. He say, in my country, the building control regulation is very stringent and frequently we have some difficulties to justify the restoration or strengthening works for compliance to euro codes such as EC5 for timber, EC6 for uh, masonry, etc. I hope the panel can shed some lights of this. Uh, thank you very much. By the way, our oldest buildings here is only about 200 years. So can we guess this doubles up as a quiz? <laughs> I, I was thinking which country could be that. Um, I'm not sure. So I, I'd, I'll offer you some thoughts if, if that's okay. I, I can't speak to all countries in the world, but I, I can speak to certainly Scotland where, where I live and also England and Wales where I, I'm, I've also done quite a bit of work. Um, the, the building 
regulations um, in these countries are um, contrary to what most people think and off quite quite loose and and all they require you to do is to produce a rational means of justifying that your structure stands up it it, it gives you that option it also gives you the option of using prescriptive methods set down by codes and practice codes of practice and, and standards and so forth but you don't have to adopt them you are perfectly free and entitled to adopt a different method if providing you you've got the the right justification and the right rationale and design philosophy to do so and i i think it would be it would be nice if if that was that was the principles that were adopted more widely and more generally if that if that isn't the case and isn't other people's experience yeah we will have to consider the context because sometimes we assume every country is like ours and mm. there are lots of variations as you know and even you know between italy and uk <laughs> which i live in both countries i can see a lot of differences and things that maybe are more relaxed in some countries are more stringent in others so of course we have to work with the local regulations uh, but you can also influence that no i think we all have experiences of you know pointing out to maybe better practices and that's why we are here basically <laughs> because if that, uh, things like that that there is more uh, flexible view on how you assess these structures in your country you can refer to other countries and things can change <laughs> so i think we, we would like to make that point as well i don't know alberto if you want to, to uh, yes about the, the the rules the the there is always the main principle that the minimum intervention but uh, we have to explain what means minimum intervention is the minimum to help the structure the original structure without to transform it in such a way it make its own best so we have to help the structure in such a way they perform the best of our internal original structural philosophy yeah I always say that that the, the minimum intervention is contextual because sometimes depends think minimum is just quantity, which is <laughs> not. <laughs> it's not, not a quantity, it's, it's, it's a problem of quality. Mm -hmm. It's qualitative, not quantitative. And I think, especially for students, because we have also students here in the room, um, I think we have to make that always very clear. And there are many examples uh, about that. There are lots of thank yous um, in the chat. Uh, I don't think there is another question as such. Again, uh, for the attendees, um, just feel free. Uh, but I just would like to stress as well this fact that, as you have seen, it's all about methodology. And sometimes, you know, uh, we expect to have only the kind of uh, technical aspect of going straight into intervention. And something that that's why I, I want to organize these things is because uh, what is disseminated sometimes is about only the technical solution in terms of, you know, the, the technique use uh, in the intervention. And I don't think there is enough dissemination on the actual what is behind that, no? Uh, how you have assessed the structure, what methodology you follow. Uh, and I think it's so important because it's all about that, as uh, Matthew say and um, Alberto say that, you know, it's only when you have considered everything, then you maybe you add something. <laughs> but if the assessment is really uh, the fundamental part uh, of this. I wanted to ask you actually about BIM. Uh, what is your take in BIM? Uh, in your bit of structural engineering, because um, as you know, it's now extended practice to use BIM. And I don't know, in, in your own experiences or your own um, approach to it? Mm, not yet, because uh, it's very difficult um, to transform uh, a, a now there are people is working on this point uh, how to uh, uh, put in a beam uh, program uh, the, the geometrical survey of uh, existing structures it's not easy it's, beam is born more is, uh, is more easy to be used for new structures but uh, when you have to put in a beam model an existing structure and then uh, the 
uh, make, uh, make an interpretation of this uh, behavior from a structural point of view is not very, very easy. Yeah, I mean, my, my thoughts on it would be that it, it's coming a long way in recent years from, from where, it, where it has been. The, the, the big game changer that we found is the, the point cloud survey, which is a way of scanning a structure with a laser and then recording all the points and getting that then into your computer model. And it's certainly something we've been using recently to, to, to bring some some structures back back to life in a computer. I, I've actually, I've got somebody down in uh, uh, Odiham, uh, uh, an old castle which is ruined, um, and they've got some problems with, uh, with with cracking in the arch. And, and we've made or we're making a point cloud survey, and that will let us bring it into the computer and, and help us understand how, how that's behaving in three D. Um, I, th I think also ironically the pandemic has made a big difference to that as well because we we haven't been able to visit sites in the way that we have so certainly in in, in the last six months I, i've had drones and all kinds of things flying about sites so that i can see and inspect them from from the comfort of my my office home and some of that technology i i have no doubt in the future would you know people will be attaching point clouds onto drones to, to, to go up and look at um so I think it's it's definitely something that's that's on its way, and it, it's definitely going to be making a difference in in, in the years ahead. I would have thought. Yeah, important of uh, technology for sure. We have to take that on board, but still to crack the point cloud transfer into the actual model. I uh, still I would be interested to see your uh, take on that because uh, it's still I think uh, again in terms of dissemination you find lots of people talking about that these days. But we are actually specifically looking at how it's transfer the point cloud to the actual model, and we see nobody actually tell much about it because it's still is someone picking points <laughs> manually. <laughs> And um, I think it's, it's the kind of things we, we need to, to look at and way forward. And actually, uh, Matthew, I wanted to tell you the actual, the first kind of attempt to do a structural engineering was a Spanish architect in the 16th century called Rodrigo Gil de Antañón. <laughs> because um, I, I think it's uh, normally it's the, the St. Peter's uh, taken, but actually the, the one who attempted that was him. Uh, so that I will tell you more about that. <laughs> okay. um, just checking if in the chat uh, there are no more questions. Ah, okay. Yes, there are some comments on the. Um, um, okay, I think there is a, there is a question. I think for um, Alberto, can the damage in the CC Basilica be caused in a more great factor by the accumulation over the centuries that by the quake itself? And if so, why in those areas? So that's um, the material I think you say already that was bad maintenance, basically, that they kept accumulating. Yes, yes, yes. Th there is a, a, an accumulation of, of damages. Clearly, the last earthquake is only the last. Uh, but uh, you have to take into account that uh, not always, uh, the, not all the earthquakes uh, uh, have the main direction in the weaker direction of the basilica. So. There are uh, in, in the middle of the 19th century, there was another strong earthquake, but to work at the 90 degree direction uh, respect to the, the last one. And uh, uh, it, it caused the collapse of the vault of the Basilica of Santa Maria degli Angeli in, uh, at the base of the hill of Assisi, because uh, the, the direction of the main direction, the axial direction of Santa Maria degli Angeli is at 90 degree, at 90 degree uh, respect to the main axis of the Basilica of Assisi. So that uh, uh, earthquake caused the collapse of Santa Maria degli Angeli. The last one caused the collapse of Assisi, but not the, the collapse of Santa Maria degli Angeli. So it's very important to take into account the direction of each earthquake on the same building. So different earthquakes may have different effects on the same building because of the main direction. This is very important. All the earthquake make also an accumulation of damages. So after centuries, the, 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 the structure is always more weaker than the, in the original situation. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, 
Camila Colas in the audience and is making some uh, good observations there about uh, how being is uh, has been addressed both in Italy and EU projects. Uh, we have another question that uh, about um, the importance of material characterization and compatibility um, as part of the structural assessment. You want mm. to um, go on, Alberto. You go for it. I'll, I'll follow you. <laughs> What about the uh, material characterization? So the study, not just the overall uh, structure, but actually the the properties of the of the material to be taken into the overall assessment. Um, yes, it, uh, this is one of the four ways of knowledge we have to control, also with uh, experimental analysis. Uh, about the, the characteristic of the materials to, to use materials compatible with the historical ones. Um, there are many, many studies about this. So the, 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 we have to be sure that new materials are not in, uh, can, can, can be compatible with the original ones. Many times we, we, we forget that Many times the, 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 the decay of the material is not on the historical one, but on the new one. Many times the new one, the new material added to an historical structure uh, decay very, very fast because incompatible with the historical structure. So it's, uh, are um, much more the cases of the, uh, in which the new materials decay very faster than the historical ones because of inc incompatibility with historical ones. Um, I, I think what I would say about materials is it depends what the question is that you're answering. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's important to know whether a material squashes or stretches or whether it's impermeable or whether it absorbs water and, and it's important to have that sort of qualitative understanding so that you don't put things together that shouldn't be together but probably the most frequent question i get asked isn't isn't really to do with that it, it's more to do with how strong something is and and people have a, a a habit of conducting lots and lots of tests to try and prove how strong a particular material is. And I, I, I've never found that terribly helpful because in old structures, it, it tends to be natural materials where you have great variation in, in the strength uh, of the materials. And to try and treat them as if they're modern materials that are made in a factory is, is probably the wrong approach to start with. So I, 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 I think quite often just some of the old tried and tested rules of thumb in terms of strength will give you an answer which is pretty much as good as taking lots of samples from a structure to test or crush. Um, but on the other hand, understanding some of the other um, ways in which material can behave other than strength is, is probably more important in my experience. But I think you both will agree that we need more integration. There is a lot of heritage science, structure engineering, architecture, but it's all doing their own thing. And it's when you put all together that you get a better, I think, um, idea of what happens with buildings. No? Um, there is a question there as well. Uh, in what extent it could be acceptable, acceptable to change original conceptions of the load without being understood as a detriment to, of its authenticity? <laughs> Small question there. Um, and I think, Matthew, you touched on that about the, how you put yeah. it, the Euclidean, not change Euclidean to Excel. <laughs> I quite like that. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, I think it, it, it's quite a philosophical question and, and having tried to break things up into sort of a, a simple way to explain them, I, I'll maybe muddy the water a, a little bit and make it complicated again. The, the thing about structures is that we're not always 100% sure what the real load path is. And there may be lots of different ways in which the structure could be standing. Our role as a structural engineer is to find one of them and to make sure that there's at least one way in which the structure could be standing. So when, when we approach particularly an old structure 
um, it may well be that it was conceived in a particular way and the load was assumed to, 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 to spread in a particular way and have a particular load path. But if there's been a little bit of settlement somewhere over a period of time, then some of that load may have shifted to somewhere else in the structure. And it may not be behaving as, as was originally tended, in, intended when, when we come to find that structure years and years later. So when, when you talk about authenticity, it, it's authenticity to what? The way that you find it now, the way that it was 200 years ago, or the way that it was when it was built. And, and so for that reason, I, I don't know that there's a simple answer. I, I think you just have to treat each one a, a, as a bespoke case. And in some cases, it will be better to treat it as it was designed. In other cases, it will be better to treat it as you find it to be. And then in other cases, it, it, it might be necessary to change it. So I, I'm afraid that's not a terribly brilliant answer because I've given you kind of a question back, haven't I? But I, I think that's the way existing buildings are. They're messy and, and, and dealing with them is messy. Alberto, do you want to, to comment on the issues? You talk about the Santa Sofia, Agoya Sofia, and we can see there a dome composed in various uh, period, although trying to keep to the original uh, design. So yeah, it's complex. I don't know if you want to add something on that. Uh, the the uh, Hagia Sophia is, is not very uh, is very near to the original uh, configuration. So uh, they in the in the time they they were added only some um, abutments to take into account the trust of the of the dome because. Uh, uh, the, the original structure had uh, some uh, problem that are still uh, now because uh, it is continuously under monitoring. So the, the very, the, the big, there is a big importance to monitoring the situation of this kind of monuments uh, because uh, uh, the trust of the main dome and the main arches. Uh, and so there is a, a tendency of the, of the, of, of the, the structure to, to to open. So uh, in the past time, um, there were many, many interventions with abutments made, made especially by the Turkish architect, uh, the great Turkish architect uh, Sinan during the time of um, Soleimani, Soleimani, the Magnificent. And uh, he, he probably have a, make a very good improvement in the global behavior. So now, the, we can say that the, the, it's uh, probably more, more stiff, more stable than uh, before. But, uh, however, there are still some movement because of the viscosity of this kind of, uh, of uh, masonry. The Byzantine masonry have uh, uh, the characteristic of have a very, very thick uh, mortar joints between the, the bricks. Many times the mortar joints is thicker than the brick. And uh, this is uh, apparently a, not in agreement with the, the uh, classical rule that uh, we know that the masonry is more strong, more uh, have a higher strength and stiff, a stiffness, uh, lower, a th a thinner is the joint. So the, in the Roman time, uh, the period of Hadrian, we have the best masonry structures and uh, the mortar joint was only two or three millimeters between the bricks. And this is probably the top about uh, the masonry structures. And uh, in, in, the, in the Byzantine time, uh, they, they use a very thick uh, mortar joints and this improve visco uh, viscous deformations. But uh, we have to take into account why they do this. Because uh, Already, at, not only at the time of Giustiniano, they used these thick joints, but already the Masori built at the time of Costantino and the other uh, Theodosio and so on, they use mortar joints thicker than in Rome. Why? I think because they were aware that the seismic action in uh, Istanbul are very higher than the seismic action in Italy, for example, the uh, maximum, the top uh, 
the, the top plateau of the design spectrum of L'Aquila, where we have the earthquake in, in 2009, is the half of the design spectrum, spectrum the higher intensity of the design spectrum in Istanbul. We have a 0 0.7, 0 0.6, 0 0.7 of, at the plateau, uh, 0 0.7 G um, at the plateau in, 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 uh, in L'Aquila and uh, 1.2 in the plateau in Istanbul. So they decided to have Masuri, the, the Byzantines and the late Romans uh, working at the time of Constantino and Theodosio, they probably try to have uh, a more ductile masonry respect to the masonry used in, uh, in Italy, for example. So we have to take into account many aspects. Well, ductility, we know there is an important aspect in seismic uh, structures. So uh, probably if the, 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 the Hagia Sophia had some collapse, but uh, sustained earthquakes very higher than the earthquakes happened in Italy. And it is standing up also with some collapse. So it's not wrong, the work of the architect at the time of Giustiniano. They, but th there is the other aspect, if you have a more ductile uh, 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 Masuri, you have also more viscous deformation. So there is a, some aspect I have to take into account also in this, in this point of view. So the, 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 probably they was uh, conscious that they were making something more deformable, but because they wanted to, uh, they had to, to, to take into account very higher seismic actions. Yeah, I think this conversation could go really long because we have all these issues of when you intervene, are you kind of replicating the defects or you make it better as you have seen it? So it gets into this all philosophical debate that hopefully we'll have a follow up on this. Uh, so I think there are no more questions. Uh, oh, there is one, no? No, I don't think we have more. So just thank very much again, the speakers and all the people have attended today. I hope you have enjoyed as much as I have. Um, just to highlight this, you know, this um, three dimensional yeah. aspects of, uh, you know, the study of structures and the importance of history, actually, as you have seen, construction history, how fundamental is to have that in the, into the equation, no? I have to answer just the two, one question. Oh, after one. The, yeah. the, the, the program, the, the um, analysis program I used, that was, these two models are made during the 90s. At, yeah. that, at that time, I used the Algor. Mm -hmm. Now I use other program because Algor had not uh, uh, nonlinear uh, insight, nonlinear uh, tools. Uh, the the nonlinear analysis are made by with post processors made by us, mm -hmm. uh, but now we use uh, other programs that have more uh, more easy uh, nonlinear analysis. And also to say that you have extensively published, so people interested in the projects also they can find and read more details on the paper. So thanks for pointing that out. So again, thanks so much, uh, uh, a virtual uh, clap <laughs> to both of you. And um, thanks everybody for attending. And we will follow up with other seminars and we we'll look forward to seeing you there. Thanks again. Bye. Bye.